Stanford University. Science fiction has promised us house cleaning robots for many years. Let me ask,、um, who here would like a robot to clean your house? Yeah, <laughs> everyone wants a robot. We think of science. We think of house cleaning robots as being the realm of science fiction, but is that really the case? Let me show you a video of this robot over here.、Um, there's actually a cheat in this video, and things aren't exactly as they appear. But let's watch the video first. So there's that robot cleaning up an apartment, and、um, it turns out that instead, rather than just tidying up, it can also sweep, dust, vacuum,、uh, water flowers, fetch food,、um, use a dishwasher. You know, seems like it must be an incredibly smart robot to do all these things, and we'd all love to have one, right? But it turns out there's a cheat in this video, and this robot wasn't smart at all. This was the cheat.、Um, the way the video was made was there was a grad student sitting a little bit off camera, using a joystick to very slowly and painfully control every tiny motion of the robot. And it's actually much slower and much more painful to clean your house this way than to just walk in there and do it yourself. <laughs> so. What does this mean? If we want house cleaning robots, this means that、um, what's really missing is the software. We see, we've seen that our robots are physically or mechanically capable of doing almost all the household chores we like them to, but what's missing is the artificial intelligence software to make them smart enough to do this themselves. So in robotics,、um, we need software to do two main things. We call them control and perception. Control means once you know where you want the robot to move or what motion you want it to make, how to get it to to make that motion. And perception means getting the robot to see the world around it and understand what's around it. So let's start with talking about control. When I started working on robotics about 10 years ago, I asked a lot of people, you know, what's the hardest control problem you know of? And back then, the most common answer I heard was getting a computer to fly a helicopter. So I said, let's work, let's work on that.、Um, and our helicopter over here is instrumented with、uh, GPS, accelerometers, and a compass, and so it always knows where it is. It turns out flying helicopters is pretty difficult.、Uh, if you're ever in a helicopter and you're watching the pilot, the pilot is holding one joystick in each hand, one control stick in each hand, and each foot is on a different foot pedal, and they're actually always moving, you know, both hands and both feet to try to keep the helicopter balanced. So for a computer, the problem is 10 times a second you tell where the helicopter is, and you need to figure out how to move all these control sticks to keep the helicopter in the air.、Um, when I first got my hands on a helicopter, the first thing I thought was, you know what? I know math. Let's just write out a mathematical specification for how helicopters behave, and we'll program the math specification into a computer, and we'll. And then the computer will know how to fly the helicopter that way.、Um, turns out I have a friend who had taken that approach. Let me play a video that I got from him. When I play this video, you hear David's voice say "Enable Control," and that's when his program takes over this helicopter. Oops, excuse me. There. Enable Control. Enable. Uh, about, about, about. So, <laughs> so there's him shouting "abort, abort."、Um, so when I saw this, what I realized is that helicopters are just too complicated, and their aerodynamics are just too complicated. No one can sit down and just write out a mathematical specification for how to fly a helicopter. Um, instead, what I realized is that a much better way to try to do this is to let a computer learn by itself how to fly a helicopter. So what you do is you give the give the computer access to a, heli- to, to a helicopter and let it try out different things on the helicopter and try out different strategies for flying it and see what happens and learn from his own experiences, much like a beginner pilot might, to figure out how to fly a helicopter.、Um, this is also maybe not unlike how you may have learned to ride a bicycle, trying out different things until. After a while, you get it. So researchers call this technique machine learning, and using this method, we've been able to not only get the helicopter to fly around, but also get it to fly many different, many interesting aerobatic stunt maneuvers.、Um, let me show you just one video of one of the aerobatic stunt maneuvers that we flew on this helicopter. This is a video that we made on the Stanford football field, just flying under computer control. And when we zoom out the camera, you see the trees planted in the sky. 
So, among being able to fly upside down, this is the first helicopter in the world able to do so under computer control. Um, we, our helicopters can now fly, uh, diff fly maneuvers and stunt maneuvers at a skill level comparable to the very best human fighters in the world. So we seem to be doing pretty well on control. Um, let's look at perception next. Let's use an example. Let's say I tell my robot to please find my coffee mug. Um, because we know how to do control, my robot can drive to, the, uh, drive to the kitchen to start looking for my coffee mug. And let's say my robot sees this picture. Um, where does it think the coffee mug is? If you run a computer vision, if you run a standard computer vision algorithm, this is the sort of result we get. It completely misses where the coffee mug is. Um, so why is this hard? It turns out that your and my visual systems are so good, it's almost hard for us to understand how a computer could fail to recognize what that is. But uh, let's zoom into a small part of the mug. Where you and I see a coffee mug, the computer sees this. That's a grid of numbers, or that's a matrix of pixel brightness values, also called pixel intensity values. Then uh, the computer vision task is to look at all those numbers and to decide that those numbers represent the rim of a coffee mug. Um, in computer vision, we don't just want to recognize coffee mugs. We also want to recognize people and faces, have depth perception to tell how far away things are. And it seems like you must need very complicated mathematical functions or very complicated computer programs to look at all those numbers and figure out what's going on in an image. And in fact, this is mostly what computer vision researchers have done, which is write very complicated programs to try to understand different parts of an image. Um, these are illustrations from six of the leading computer vision programs. The technical term is features, but six of the leading programs to try to do vision. And you know what? Sadly, they're really, these are really complicated programs, but none of them work that well yet. Um, Perception for robots isn't just vision. We also want it to understand audio. For example, we want the robot to understand when I say words to it. And it turns out we're starting to have software that can do speech recognition, but that's still hard. And uh, it's hard for a similar reason as vision. The speech recognition problem is to look at a waveform like that, to look at you know, the curve like that, which is what the microphone records, and to decide that that curve, that waveform, corresponds to me saying, robot, please find my coffee mug. So because it seems like you need a really complicated function to do this, once again, audio researchers have spent many years writing really complicated programs to try to do these tasks. And, and again, it was you know, starting to get there, but not quite. So when I started to work on uh, perception, um, and I saw the state of field, what I started to do was try to write even more complicated programs. You know, like, let's write even more complicated programs than anyone else in the world. Um, but uh, but, but for, for a long time, I tried to do that and, and made no progress. I was getting very low traction. I was getting very frustrated. And for a long time, I actually so at least seriously doubted my own ability to make any contribution to this view because things were so complicated. And it was just so hard to get it to work and just was not making progress. Then five years ago, I came across one new idea that completely re-energized my thinking in how to get robots to be smart. This is the idea. It is that if you look at how the human brain does perception, rather than needing tons of algorithms for vision, tons of algorithms for audio, it may be that most of how the brain does it may be a single learning algorithm, a single program. Um, this would be a learning program. And uh, if this is true, then maybe we don't need to figure out all these different complicated programs. Maybe we need to just figure out one program, maybe something like whatever the brain is doing, and that will let us make progress much faster on perception. So why do we think that the brain may need just one algorithm or just one program to do, you know, to do all the wonderful things we do in perception? Let me show you some of the evidence from uh, neuroscience. So that red part of the brain is your auditory cortex. Uh, the way you're understanding my words now is your ears are sending a sound signal to your auditory cortex, which is in processing the sound signal. Neuroscientists have done the following amazing experiments. You can cut the wire from the ears to the auditory cortex and rewire the brain so that the signal from the eyes, from the optic nerve, gets routed to the auditory cortex. If you do this, that red part of the brain, that red piece of brain tissue, will learn to see, will learn to process images. And uh, these animals can do visual discrimination tasks. They can use that auditory cortex to understand images and you know, look at things and tell things about the world from vision. 
Uh, one more quick example. That red part of your brain is your somatosensory cortex and uh, is responsible for, for, for your sense of touch. If you do a similar rewiring experiment, your somatosensory cortex will learn to see. That same red piece of brain tissue will learn to process images. So it turns out there's a ton of evidence like this, a lot of experiments like these, that suggest that the same piece of brain tissue can process sight or sound or touch or even other things. And therefore, perhaps the same, maybe just one computer program, maybe the same computer program, the same algorithm, can process sight or sound or touch. And uh, if we can discover what that algorithm is and get our computers to do that, maybe that's, that'll let us make much faster progress in our perception. Um, so how does the brain work? Well, your brain and mine are jam-packed full of neurons that are tightly connected to and that talk to each other. In a computer, we can therefore build what's called an artificial neural network. The other technical term is a sparse learning algorithm. But we can build a neural network that simulates all of these neurons being connected to and talking to each other. Um, well, finally, what do we want these neural networks to do? Let's turn to biology one last time. It turns out that uh, um, it turns out that um, if you look at how the brain processes images, the way you and I see, the first thing your brain does when you, you see an image is your brain will look for short lines in the image. It'll look for edges in the image. Um, for example, there's probably a neuron in your brain right now looking for a short vertical line like that shown on the left. And there's probably a different, in your ne different neuron in your brain looking for a 45 degree line like that shown on the right. Um, here are 16 little edges or lines that 16 neurons in your brain may be looking for, as shown at lower resolution. What we did was we ran the learning algorithm, and for what we knew occurs in biology, which is what's shown on the left, we found the closest matches in what the learning algorithm can do, and that's shown on the right. And sort of not a perfect match, but this means that a piece of software can explain you know, early visual processing in, in your brain and mine remarkably well. Um, how about audio? Well, it turns out we visualize sound snippets. We visualize audio using spectrograms, which are pictures that look like these. But this corresponds, corresponds to six different sound snippets that the neuron in your uh, auditory processing system may be looking for. Um, we ran exactly the same learning algorithm as from the previous slide. And for each of these, found the closest match. And there it is. And what this means is that one computer program was the exact same computer program can, on the one hand, do a surprisingly good job mimicking how the brain processes vision and do a surprisingly good job mimicking how the brain processes audio. And it turns out it can mimic how we process touch, too, and so on. Um, and so what are the implications of computer vision? Does this work? Uh, the final thing we did was take these ideas and apply them to computer vision tasks. And with done this on various benchmarks with varying degrees of success. But uh, let me share with you just one result. On, this, uh, on one particular benchmark, classical computer vision you know, recognizes objects correctly 87% of the time. But when you use neural network, the accuracy jumps up to near perfect. Uh, one last example, and then I'll close. So recently, just for fun, we actually sent a robot out around my office to look for coffee mugs. Um, initially, these were the results we were getting. That's a map of my office building. And initially, we were getting results like these, where every red dot is a mistake made by the algorithm. Um, we did a lot of things to improve the algorithm. We changed the, to, to, to change the system. Uh, we added sensors. We improved the algorithm. But now, our most recent result looks like this. On the most recent run, out of 28 coffee mugs, they found 28 for 28. Um, and there, in fact, are all the, co all the students' coffee mugs they found. There's a lot of them. Um, so let me just close with a personal story. Um, ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to work on AI and build smart robots. And then I got older, and I got into college, and I started to learn about AI in college, and I learned how hard it was. And it turns out that AI has given us tons of great stuff. AI has helped us to build web search engines like Google and Bing. It's given us spam filters. It's really given us tons of great stuff. But there was always this bigger dream of not just building web search engines and spam filters, but of getting machines that can see the world and think and understand the world and be intelligent the way that people are. And um, for the longest time, I gave up on that bigger dream. And, and uh, uh, for many years as a professor, I was even advising students you know, to not think about that bigger AI dream because it was just too hard. It was failed for many years. It's not, it was too hard to make progress. And, and that, that, that last part, the way I was advising students, is something I'm, I'm no, not that proud of now. 
Um, and it was only five years ago when I learned about these ideas in neuroscience and machine learning that the brain might be much simpler than, than we had thought and that it might be possible to replicate some of how the brain works on the computer and use that to build perception systems. Uh, that, about five years ago, was the first time in my adult life when I felt like we might have a chance of making progress in, in this again. And in terms of uh, getting this robot to clean your house, I think our best shot is if we figure out how the brain works and uh, uh, program it that way to make it smart enough to actually clean your house by itself. Um, I might be wrong, a lot of what I'm saying may turn out to be false, what we're working on may completely fail, but uh, uh, when I look at, when we look at all of our lives, right, I see, I see all of us spending so much time in acts of mental drudgery. Um, we spend so much time cleaning our houses, filling out silly paperwork, having to go shopping for trivial items, and I think uh, if we can make our robots and computers smart enough to do some of these things for us, to free up, free up our time for higher endeavors. You know, what could be more exciting than that? Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.